Grief is not something that is often discussed in Canadian society, and grief education in general is often neglected, and numerous myths exist around grief. Dying with Dignity Canada's mission is that through advocacy, public education, and personal support, Dying with Dignity Canada ensures Canadians have access to quality end-of-life choice and care. It can be argued that quality end-of-life care transcends into grief education, as it is something that affects not only the dying person, but the family and friends left behind. Grief literacy is in no way a clinical offering, but instead is one that focuses on public education. I'd now like to invite those of you watching from home to light a candle, if you feel called to do so and if your space allows for it. This is to honor the people we're speaking about today and anyone in your life whose memory is at top of mind during today's session. Today's topic is approaches to death and dying, grief and healing in First Nation communities. And we are joined today by Elva Jameson and Joanne Gottfriedson, who are going to discuss various Indigenous traditions and beliefs related to death, dying, and grief, as well as how dying people and those who are grieving are supported. So I'll now invite Joanne and Elva to uh, both turn on their webcams and uh, introduce themselves. Uh, Joanne, would you like to go first and tell us a bit more about yourself? White to white is like the Pusmin the Mik Mawikutum, Joanne Godfordson is quest, uh ki a whisper and an oaken, a moot as it unlooks to show what me. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this opportunity of sharing, and it makes my heart very happy to be able to be a part of our, our ways. My name is Joanne Godfordson. My traditional name is Kia Huismanilfin in English. It's Old Lady Buffalo Woman. I come um, to you from and I acknowledge my own territory to come loops to Shewapne in the interior of British Columbia. Thank you so much, Joanne and Elva. Um scan or swagwego, ever have it need yaso, but your corner ni walk wenza dan, they go to net with tahioni ni walk a shoot dan. Ne had ni a gatanoni sang de gwedi. Niki sang gang wa hunda wooden da ne scan or east one of dunya hawk. Um my English name is Elva Jameson and my traditional name means she carries flowers. I'm from the Kyuga Nation and Wolf Clan of the Haudenosaunee people. And I, I wish my first greeting was to um, um, peace and wellness, uh, well-being to all of you that are that are here with us today. And I'm hoping that some, even some small message, will go to you today to help with your own, uh, with your own well-being. Even one person gain, it would be worth, it would be worth the time. You know, my, Thank you. Thank you so much, Alva. And uh, now we're going to get into um, the presentation component of today's webinar. And uh, Joanne is going to get us started today. So I'll hand it over to you, Joanne. You can go ahead. Thank you very much. When um, we as First Nations people view death, we look at it holistically. We look at how our mind, our body, our heart, and our spirit live, react, and endure the process. When <clears throat> There are many stages that we look at because we look at life as a learning ex experience. And when we die, we look at it as an, an everlasting blissful life. And we, through our life's journey, we work towards that. We, because of our beliefs and values, we have many ceremonies and rituals that we follow during this, I like to call it a sacred journey or the end of life journey, but it, it is a very blissful, sacred time. And not as we prepare for that, we have to also look at, there may be sudden deaths. There may be um, unexpected deaths, um, you know, going through surgery and not being able to come out of it or whatever ways that our bodies um, leave this world. It leaves behind a deep impact in our families and our loved ones, our coworkers, our nation. 
and others that we interact with. We connect our whole world in a holistic perspective. And we, we give ceremonial purposes to everything that we do. Although with COVID and, and everything changing, it's really difficult for our nations to really uh, maintain our cultural ways of honoring our loved ones. And before we get to someone dying, <clears throat> we have to look at that whole process of, of someone leaving this world, you know, um, the shock of them, first of all, being sick or, you know, um, going through different stages of different diseases, you know, and that last final journey, how, you know, the skin changes and they get blotchy, they're pale, they don't want to eat anymore, they don't want to drink, their body functions are not operating in the natural process. And our families are witnessing this. And it is now getting um, out there where it's important for us to prepare our, our people, no matter how old you are, from the, the children to the oldest member of our community. Some of the rituals that we do is in, in my territory, I, I can share that, is that we go we have a whole process of if somebody dies or not if when somebody dies there if it's a woman a woman the women in our in our community are trained to take care of the body for example um when we die there's a, a medicine that we prepare, prepare they cleanse the body every part of the body they dress them and then they're gone to the morgue for you know if, if families decide embalmment or or not um the women do that and if it's a man the men do that as well or in certain families uh, women are gifted to do that so during that time that they're you know in the morgue preparing um and we always remember that our foot tracks are traced by our feet and our mess, our trail to the crater. We don't wear shoes. We wear moccasins. Or if people have a favorite pair of shoes, we may put them in the casket. The other thing that we commonly do is that in my territory, um, we wrap them in a blanket because we want to protect them. And, and they, because they've earned that eternal blissful life now. So we wrap them and comfort them and send them in a good way. During those times, we have sacred fires that burn for four days um, as soon as the message is out that our loved one has left. Only men are responsible for taking care of the fire. Only women are responsible for preparing the food. Um, the people get fed because our families gather. And we have morning and sunrise ceremonies. And we, um, on during the four days, that's the opportunity for relatives, loved ones to come and pay respects. Um, we, if, it, if uh, for some reason it's on, we're not able to have open coffin, um, we have a picture so that people can uh, release some of their, their grief. We, we look at um, the roles within our community. <clears throat> in my nation, men and women are equal and they have equal responsibilities. Although the women um, guide and direct, we always put men as chiefs and, and direct them that way or family members. Each family member has a, a matriarch and it, a woman that, um, you know, uh, collectively gets the wishes and clearly knows the traditions and the ceremonies of, of our, our people. And we have to remember that we can't just think about how that affects our people because we live it. We have to feel it. Our emotions are intact where we're, one, we're in shock or we're denying it, we're angry, we're frustrated. All of these emotions affect all of us. And then 
the reason that we have rituals is so that we have this strength and the means to help our people accept that death somehow during and we have one year of a mourning period where our people cannot in participate in ceremonies they have to be behind the scenes um, we can't hunt fish or gather medicines um, because a long time ago the people were supposed to be kind and generous and they're supposed to help you but a lot of times that has changed in in, the, in our communities but a lot of the practices are being enacted we all gather and we all feast and we um people nowadays are a long time we did not commit but it's becoming more known in our communities but the traditional people always believe that we came out from mother earth and we go back into mother earth and so the men are the only ones who are allowed to dig the grave the men are the only ones allowed to pack the coffin and because the women are very sacred because we give life we don't put away life so that's a process for us um, we have ghost riders that um, we have one man that leads the horses because we are from the horse people out here. And the lead horseman has an empty horse and that represents the spirit of that individual. So they commonly go from their home to the graveyard so that they are put away in a good way. Um, our, some of our people during that sacred time um, are in ceremonial times where they may fast, they have pipe ceremonies, they have singing, dancing, because it really is a celebration of life for that individual. And on the fourth day in our nation, we have what we call stick games. It's a, the family puts up something of great value of the individual, or they could put money nowadays, and we play stick games and the people often um, challenge each other because in our society, in our, in our culture, we like to have fun and we like to acknowledge and we can be very serious, but this is a way of lifting up spirits because during that time, people are laughing and singing and drumming and sharing stories. Uh, our people are great storytellers and, uh, the other thing that we do um, is becoming, you know, once we face death, but before we even get there, we, we are taught how to take care of things. Um, like our hair, for example, we, when our close relative, our father, mother, especially our mother, if she dies, um, a lot of our traditional people have long hair, they braid it or they keep it down because our belief is that the creator lifts us up by our braids and brings us on our journey. And also the, our braids are our connection to our mother. So when we're born, that uh, cord that connects the mother and child is cut in two places, the beginning and the end. And so that first breath of air that the child takes on their own, so then when we go back and we go through that full circle, our braids are reconnecting our mother and our connection to the creator or and our ancestors. So that's what brings us up. And then the people that are left behind, um, the immediate family, all cut their hair. There are certain ones that are cut at the grave site and put in with, with the coffin. The other ones are burnt. So our world is full of lots of rituals and traditions, but how do we overcome though? You know, and I think that the rituals in our culture really help us. But now as we, we, we can't gather, we have to turn to other means. Um, for example, I work with um, Camp Carry, which is a nonprofit society that works with grieving and dying at all levels from the child all the way up to all the ones that are left. And we have our mental health experts. We have our spiritual cultural people that we depend upon dearly for their guidance and, and to carry out the things that we need to do. 
And a lot of times when um, we always wait, seems like too late to find out really what our wishes are. But now I'm, I'm a great advocate to ensure that um, I would say, Eva, what are some of your final wishes um, that you'd like before you leave this world or after you leave your world? I would record it, I'd write it for her, uh, and I would inform the family that those are those wishes because we vary, you know, and it's really important that we honor the loved ones by granting them their wishes. And really, a lot of people take a lot of thought because they're thinking about their loved ones that are still living and that have to endure loss and grief. And that's painful. But we have choices. And we have help and we have ceremonies and we have traditions to help us ease over those rocky times. And you know, when I think about, um, I can reflect back, um, my older sister was a vibrant lady and she got sick all of a sudden. And uh, so they did a biopsy and I was sitting there with the doctor in Prague, um, the prognosis was she had um, pancreatic cancer. So we were meeting um, with this specialist to determine, we thought, what treatment would take place. The specialist was very direct and says, do you have pancreatic cancer? You have 30 days. And we're all shocked. Like, I thought we were talking about treatment. So we put a team together to address the spiritual, the cultural, the medical needs, her personal care. We had 24 hour care because she wanted to die at home. And when you're dying at home on the reserve, we, we don't have provincial guidelines to follow that closely. We are under the federal, we don't, and you know, and we can choose our own ceremonies and the way we do it. But if we're going outside, like we don't have to embalm if we don't want to. Um, these uh, are really important for people to know. And there is a whole process. It's like a celebration of life. So how do we deal with that grieving and that loss? When we look deep into our hearts, and we are brave enough and have the courage to ask for help or open up so that people that are there can help us. We, we try very hard to deal with a very holistic approach. And the best thing or the most important thing I should say is that we always want to look at an individual with great dignity and pride and honor and respect. You know, it doesn't matter if they lived on the on the east side of Vancouver or if they lived in a mansion. When it comes to their final ceremony, they are treated the same. They have that dignity. They have a right to be respected and to be taken care of in of the utmost spiritual way that we can in our culture. And it's really important to understand that. Um, maybe what I can do now is turn it over to Eva so she can fill in some of her thoughts and then I'll come back after her. Oh, Eva, you're still muted. Okay, I'm trying, was trying to unmute that. Okay, um, thank you, Joanne, for all your words. And, and, and uh, that I'm on the east side, I'm on the east side of uh, Canada, and she's on the west side, and we're a thousand miles in between us. And yet our, our lot of our traditions are the same. So, um, and, and so that helps to get uh, maybe a, a fuller picture. Uh, for us over here, uh, of the Haudenosaunee people, people of the Longhouse, it's quite a bit similar what she's saying. And for us, it's like um, death is talked about. Death is talked about right from when we're small. 
um, to help us to understand maybe death of a puppy or death of a bird or a chick and even death of people. And we, we um, can, my mom's story was about how we are like corn. Sometimes you plant a corn, it don't even grow. Sometimes it grows so far and sometimes you're, you're um, working the ground around it and you cut it off by mistake. That's like a accidental. You didn't mean to do it accidental. Or sometimes it grows a little bit more and gets to the time where you can pick it for corn on the cob, it's picked again. So it doesn't make it all the way to harvest, to ripen to harvest. And she says, that's our goal. When we come here, our goal is to be, to try to make it to harvest. So she says, well, that's the way she explained um, a sudden death. She says, sometimes accidents happen. And so we just have to carry, carry on with what we're supposed to do. And some people, when they are sick and dying, a lot of the times, because it's open, we, we're open about death. It's not a secret. And so our, already people will say, will already have said, you know, when I pass away, this is what I want. I make sure my clothes are like of a mauve purplish color. I don't want no yellow or I don't want red, whatever. Or my mother too, she says, you make sure I get rice pudding, not rice and raisins cause I'm gonna knock it on the floor because I'm gonna be stronger when I'm dead. So stuff like that. And the other thing that I, I learned when my mom was dying is how thankful she was for every day. When she would say, they gave me one more day. They gave me another day to be here with you another day to spend with my family. They gave me one more day. And she was always very thankful and, um, in, in her time when she was getting to be to near, nearing the death. And so, and it's like, um, like Joanne was saying is how the rest of the family are watching. I think it makes a difference when death is talked openly, you know, and even visiting my mother-in-law you know, and she held my hand. I had to go to the hospital, see her. She's holding my hand. She goes, you know, I'm going to be thinking about you. I'm going to be thinking about you when I leave here. And, and in my heart, I thought, and I will be thinking about you until we can see each other again. Because to us, we believe in an afterlife from here. And how we were taught is when we come here, we come here to learn. We come here to share. We come here to love. We, that's why we come here for our spirit to grow, our spirit to grow. And so when we're done growing, we go back. And the other thing, what we're saying, what we're told, when we come here, we're given the how many days we're going to be here. I, when I had a miscarriage, my mom told me, she says, you know, that baby already did its job because this baby was a little girl. And she says, all her brothers were waiting in anticipation for her. Her mother and her father were waiting. And this changed you from how you used to be. It changed you. And because it changed you, she said, this baby has fulfilled its purpose. And that's only the purpose what this baby had. And the baby has gone back home. And that's how we look at that, is to go home. Because this is like a learning ground. And when we're asked, creator asks, which one of you spirits would like to go have this earth experience? Which one of you want to go? Some of us are happy over joy to come. And some of us say, oh, oh I don't really want to go, you know, because it might be hardship there. You know, then we're encouraged and we're told this is what we can learn when we come here. And we're also told that each of us brings a gift when we come here to share with all the people. We bring a gift with us. We bring our tradition with us, our whichever people we are born among, we're born um, whether they there be um, whether they be um, any one of the four colors of man, and even within our red nation, we have many other nations besides Haudenosaunee or besides um, um, you know other nations. Anishinaabe, we have more. There's and we all have a little bit of our teachings are quite similar, but there are many things that are not. Just like with Joanne talking about the horses. We don't have horses the same. And so she has that ceremony in her with her people. And we have different ceremonies as well. But we all have ceremony. And as we go through, even the baby that I lost, the baby was put back to the earth. 
through a ceremony. And so every once in a while, my mom says, that'll always be, that'll always be your, da your daughter, no matter what, that'll always be your daughter. So then that's something that I need to remember when I leave here, I'm gonna see my daughter. I'll see my daughter again. So this is how that is. And you know, my son, um, uh, he would talk, he's my son now, he's catching up to me in age, he's like 47. So he says, um, we were talking about the state of the world. We think about um, COVID as a pandemic, but we have another pandemic that people aren't, are looking the other way and that's a drug addiction. And it's all over, not just natives, all over. And he was saying, you know something? He says, you know what keeps me kind of on a straight and narrow? He says, my sister. And I'm thinking, you don't have a sister. But he says, you know, I think about one day I'm going to see my sister again. He goes, and when she looks at me, I want her to look at me with pride at the kind of man that I am, how I raise my children, how I am with my family. I want her to be proud of me. He says, and I want to look her straight in the eye and I want her to show her her big brother and how I am. He goes, she keeps me straight. So even though we lost this baby, you know, she still did fulfill the purpose. And I can see that we all of us, all of us have purpose. And when it's getting near the end of time for this particular person is to just help them, to walk with them in love, in love, so that that transition for them can be easy and the transition for us can be easy is to share the love that we carry for, for our people. And, and so this is part of it. And even myself, like some of these people that I work with, I'm not their relative. I'm not their niece. I'm not their granddaughter, but it is an elder or it is an, somebody's auntie. And I can still have my own love of people to help that person and to share that. So we have that and, and we can help them with what their wishes are, just like what Joanne was saying. You know, they want whatever they, they want for their own, how they want to be dressed. And we too have the blanket that we put around them when they leave. So that's that part of um, the dying and death. And for us, we have, um, we have a, what we call a wake, a wake. And so because the families need time to have, to have um, time to rest. So other people from outside of our clan they come there and they support the family. And they too, we do have game. We do have a game that they play. Some of us, we have, they call, it's made out of bones. It's a made out of like a deer bone and they cut it in half and one side's white, one side's dark. And they play that, like it's like a dice game, I guess. And just the same, they have um, things that the person had like knickknacks type of thing. And they, that's what they use. And, and everybody gets a gift. Everybody gets a gift, whoever comes there and are playing that, but it's only to keep awake so that um, the family can rest and um, as we're going through these days. And we have the opposite side of our fire because we have a fire in the middle. And so the opposite side of the fire comes and helps um, the, 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 the grieving people. And so like if there's somebody on the opposite side of my fire that's passed, then we go over there and we help their family so that it's always helping each other on each side of the fire. We help each other. So that's part of that benevolence what we have, we carry for each other. So that's how that works so that they're supported through the whole thing. Even when they're like, we know that somebody is getting ready to pass away, we support that family. Even if we bring a dish, that's the first thing some people will say, the ones that like to cook, as soon as there's a death, okay, I gotta cook. I gotta cook and I gotta take food there. Other people, like when a death comes, like say there was uh, homeless or not homeless, but men or mostly it usually happen men alone. They don't have people. Then it'll be like, okay, I can make the shirt for him. Somebody, I can make the moccasins for him. I'll make his breech cloth. I'll make his leggings. You know, I'll do this, I'll donate this, I'll donate, do this, I'll make his cornbread for him. So we offer that because to us, we need to be a part of that. So this person can have an easy journey. And what we say, we might've made this for you, but
but it's yours. We gift this to you. Don't worry about it. We gift it to you. So then, then that's how they're able to um, have the easier transition. So that's about the um, about the dying person. And what I was what uh, what um, what ours is is we have up to a year our grieving time. It's like up to a year, but usually we have the ten days of grieving time when um, you know the and we usually hold our people till third day and then we bury them. And all through this, there's, like I said, the wake is there, you know, the people are coming to visit and eat with the, with the person. And for the 10 days, there's that, that type of a ceremony that's happening all the time. And sometimes too, we have the fire. We have that fire for, for until the body is, like till the person is buried, we have a fire. And when we come to the fire, then we can put our cedar in there or, or we put our tobacco in the fire. You know, and so, and that too, just like what she says, it's the men, men responsibility to, to keep that fire going. So, and so when that happens, and then on a 10th day, what they do, they, during the 10 days, they get all the worldly possessions of this person. And um, if it has not been dead somebody, then they give it out. And usually they start um, immediate family, like mother and father and brother and sister, then it goes to aunts and uncles and cousins, you know? And then they always have something special for the children and always special for the partner, whoever the partner is. And if they have a medicine friend, because we, what we believe is all parts of creation is medicine for us, even each other. Even we are a medicine for each other. And some of us actually have a ceremony to solidify that friendship. And if that's happened, we have to gift that person something that belongs to our loved one that's passed. We gift them the, the, the friend. So they have a keepsake of that person. So that's how we do it. And on the 10th day is when they say, for the 10 days, they're going, they're going back and forth. They go and then they come back and see how the family is. And they go again and come back and go again. And finally they say, okay, on this 10th day now, the spirit's going to go and going to stay over there. And then so on that day, we have a big feast, a huge feast for all the family, you know, to come. And um, I think about my mom and how big that feast was because my mom, she used to, um, I had my siblings and plus my step siblings. And there was lots of us and plus the grandchildren. There's so many that called my mom, grandma. Okay, call her Jada, call her so, And so it's like, that's their grandma. And so there's lots of people, lots, a big feast. So that's where we do the giveaway, whatever's left after we make our bundles, because we bundle it up, give it away. After that, there's all kinds. Sometimes it's tools, you know, uh, dishes, anything. We put it there and say, okay, you help yourself, whatever you want, you help yourself because we need to have all of this gone. So we give everything away because that's that belong to that person. It belonged to them. So they need to let it be. And why they say we do that is so that we don't hold them, hold on to them, hold them here on this earth because their earth walk is done and they're gone back to spirit. They're gone back home. And so when we hold on to, we don't give things away that our loved ones had. It's like we hold them back because they want all their earthly possessions to be to be dispersed, to be gone. They don't want to be tied to it here. So that's why we have that. And when my mom passed away, I said, I'm going to take a year. I'm going to take a year because the kind of work I do, I work with people. I'm a traditional medicine practitioner. And so I work on people. I make traditional medicines, herbs and stuff. So I said, I'm going to take a year. I'm going to take a year. And I'm going to honor that relationship I had with my mom because my mom and I lived together the last six years of her life. And for the last, you know, 10 months of her life, she, that's when we really had to take care of her, my sister and my brother and I. Plus, we had hired two ladies that carried a language, that carried the stories so she could hear those stories. Otherwise, she would get lonesome and, you know, like she needed to hear the language. So... And in that time, I said, I'm going to take that time. So, and finally, about six months later, 
or somebody who's phoning me, they want me to help them with something. And I thought, I'm still in my side of my one year time. And I could feel somebody right here on this side pushing me. And like this, and I went like this, I thought, who is that? And my mom says, it's time to go to work now. And finally I said, okay, I'll, I'll help you on the phone. And so then I didn't make it to a year because my mom wants me to go to work. She must know that all now my grief has lifted enough where I'll be able to help the people. So, but that's usually what they say. And it's like we, a quiet time, a quiet time. We, we don't go out visiting here and there. We don't sitting in the malls or wherever. We stay home. It's like um, being quiet. So there's that 10 days or up to a year. But they say even when you're grieving up to only to a year, because they said otherwise you can get stuck in the grief and it'll carry on for years and years. And so that's why they say, um, you know, focus just to one year, then let allow yourself because there's another big feast that we have at the anniversary of the one year. We have that uh, um, feast and it, again, it's for everybody, everybody to come and um, to remember and then to go on. And every once in a while, periodically, you know, something will happen um, where, you know, spirits, they'll say, oh, we got something in the house, spirits bother me. So sometimes we have to have another feast, you know, and a lot of times it's like we feast our dead and we send them on to where the creator made a place for them, you know? And, and so it's like similar to me, how I think of it. It's like my sister, she lives, uh, lives um, miles away from me. But every once in a while, we have supper together. She'll come here, we eat. I go to her place, we eat. We come and visit, talk. When the meal is over, we clean up. We say goodbye. We go back to our own houses. It's the same with our spirits. Sometimes they come because they're lonesome for us or worried about us. And then they come and visit us. So we feed them and then we let them go back to where their place is. So that's how we do that for, for um even after the death. The other part is supporting the ones that's left behind, the ones that are in grieving. Because a lot of times when you're watching someone pass, we don't take time to do our grieving. Uh, my mom, she got cancer. She was 92, she got cancer. And I did a lot of grieving before she actually died because um, I could see her going from a vibrant person and getting ill. But when we have that grieving time, we have a tea that we drink and it's, it's a wild ginger tea with um, some people might put cedar in it. What I use is wild ginger tea with white pine and elderberries. And sometimes it's dried elderberries. It don't matter, elderberries. And that's a grief tea. What they say from our stories, it helps the grief to go through you so it doesn't get stuck in you. Because when it gets stuck in you, then you can get aches and pains that where you didn't have it before because it's stuck in, inside of you. So we use that grief tea to help clear, clear ourselves. And even with clearing the air, we need to clear the air because grief, these emotions, all of our emotions, what we have, the creator gave all of it to us. He gave us love and joy. And he also gave us a little bit of guilt because if we do something wrong, we might feel guilty. And that's to, a warning to let us know we're walking where maybe we shouldn't walk or else loneliness. That tells us that somebody is missing in my life that I really cherish, that I really like their company and they're, they're missing. And so it lets us know, it lets us know these emotions or being hurt. When somebody steps on our toes, we feel it. And so it's emotion that was given to us or fear. We get scared about something. Anxiety, it's a message to us, but something's going on we need to take care of. Or sometimes we just get angry at all of it. And so once we have a grief, sometimes I hear people blame themselves. If I only did this, if I only did that, or sometimes they blame somebody else. You know, if you'd have did that, if you'd have stayed there with them, they wouldn't have got in that car. And now I hear that. Or else sometimes they blame even the creator. Why did you take this person at this age? Why did that happen? So, but when we understand 
about the, where those emotions are coming from, then we're able to help someone. We're able to help them see because they'll be able to know, be able to say how come they're so hurt. And then they'll be able to help that healing process. So sometimes we have little kids and um, we don't have anybody but who we can talk to. And so then we end up having maybe crying, having a little breakdown. That's energy. These emotions are energy. That's in energy. So we cry because we're lonesome. We cry because we hurt that they're not here. And what happens? That energy goes into the room and it starts settling on the children, the young ones, the sickly ones, the elders. It starts settling on them. Then what happens? They start feeling it too. And first thing you know, the house is topsy-turvy because everybody's in this energy. So we have things what we use. We have a spray. A lot of times it is that white pine and cedar. We use the spray, we cook the medicine and we put it in a spray bottle and we spritz it, spritz it around. And that helps the energy to shift. And sometimes we might burn some. I noticed a while ago, Joanne, she's got her smudge going. I could see the smoke. And sometimes that's what we use. We use a smudge. And every one of those medicines, they have a different job to do. But we use the smudge and it helps to purify the air because sometimes that energy is in that light or behind that picture, you know, and the spray can't get there, but the smoke can. So we clean it up so that the children aren't walking around in this energy. And that's why we do that. Today they have oils, right? You can put lavender on your hands, clear yourself with it. Eh? Different kind of oils they use nowadays. Eh? But that's how traditionally we use spray and we use a smudge to smoke. And so that's to help to clear the energy, even off of our own selves when we're carrying it or somebody might smudge us and brush us down with a eagle feather or hawk feather or goose feather, they brush us down. Let's help, it goes inside our energy field and helps to make it straight, to remove the hurt, to help to remove the anger, to remove the loneliness, to remove any guilt we might feel that, geez, if I had only been there, so that we can get to the love again. Because you know what they say? They say, that our dead is this far away from us. The thickness of a leaf is only how far away they are to us. And so because they're there, they're that close, they hear us, they know how we feel, they still love us. They can still feel our love and we can still share our love. Feel the love, let them feel it too, because you'll be able to feel it. Just because you know, we can see them, we can hug them no more, but their energy is still inside of us. Our love for them is still in here and we can still have relationship. My mother has gone, been gone now since 2006. I have people that tell me, you know, you talk like your mother is still alive. I said, she is, she's right here and she's gonna be right here. She'll always be right here, my mother. Not only that, so is my daughter, so is my son, so is my dad, right here, right here. And so that's, that's how that is. And so when we tell, remind our people that this is, how, this is how it can be, you know, think about where they are, think about, it's okay, you know. And everybody uh, talks, everybody is different in, in their belief system. Everybody is different how they do things. And so this is how this is when we help the people that are left behind to remind them of those things that are already there. Like when I lost, when I had a hard time losing my children, my mother, she told me, she says, go lay on the earth, put a blanket down. Take your tobacco, your semi, your tobacco, and go and lay on the ground and put this tobacco on the ground and ask Mother Earth to help you. 
because she'll help to pull some of that grief off you. The other time I was having a hard time, my mom was really supportive of me. She says, take some tobacco, go outside. It's a windy day today. She says, let the wind spirits come and help to go around you and take that grief off you. Let them help you. So I'll take my tobacco, put it in my hand, standing in the wind and let the wind come. Or the water, the water. When you stand at the edge of the water, the river or lake, even a stream, and you can feel the water because our body's mostly made up of water, right? So when the water comes to us, that water can spirit can come in within us because we're made up of water and goes back out. It can take the grief. We ask, take the grief. And it can do that. It can help us. Okay? Or the sun. Haudenosaunee people, we call him big brother, the sun. And just like a big brother, a healthy big brother, they're going to protect us. We can feel the warmth from him to energize us and to help us in our grief. Even the thunder beings, when they come and bring the rain, stand in the rain, give your thanksgiving to them that they're going to wash, help to wash away some of that. What they say is when we have our death and we're getting to the funeral day, then they say, you know, it can either be a sunshiny day or it can be rain. And one of my cousins died suddenly. He died and, and it was like a shock to everybody because he was a chief. And so it was so, we were all so down about it. Our minds were falling. And so when the day of his funeral, it rained, it just rained a nice soft rain. We here we are with all our regalia. We're soaking wet because we couldn't all go in the longhouse because it's packed. But we went through and, and it didn't, after he was in the ground and people were leaving, the sun come out, and the sun come out. And I told my mom, I says, that was really strange for it, how it happened. And she says, well, that's what's supposed to happen. She says, because he, of, he was so well liked by everybody, everybody's mind is down. But the thunder beings came and they helped to wash the grief away so that we can continue to live our life that we can continue to do the job, what we come here to do. She said, so that's why that happened. And then the sun come up and she says, and it helped to dry that, helped to dry your tears. So in all parts of creation, they say it's a medicine for us. The plants, yes, but so are the elements. And so even the sun and even the moon and the stars at night, Sometimes the only job for them is to help uplift our spirit. And sometimes when our traditional ways, when we leave here, we become one of the stars. So when we look up at night, we can see our ancestors and we acknowledge them yeah, and how beautiful they are and how they are there to uplift our spirit. That's what we do. And so everything in creation can help to help us to uplift our spirit so that we can smile again. And these children that need our love can still have it. The old ones can still get taken care of. The sick can still be looked after, you know? So this is, this is what we talk about when we talk about the people that's left behind to remind them that that's, this is all there and to share our love, to share the medicines. If we have medicines, we can share it with them. So this is what we do with the grieving and we encourage them. We encourage them. We know when somebody's not coming out of their house that we there's ceremonies that what we can have to help to break that grief, to help to lift that grief. And we have one that's called a wiping the tear ceremony. And what they do, they actually use wipe the eyes, wipe the ears, drink pure water, open the throat, and clean the body up. And that's where we get that elderberry tea because we're supposed to. It, it, Elderberries is an astringent. Elderberries is an inside healer and it's um, a healing medicine. So when we drink that, it helps to heal us, heal our grief. So I can talk all day. So I think I better stop now. Um, I think that, I think you get the message about the person that's dying 
what happens at death, even after death, and what we do to help the grieving people and even the children. The children are included all the time because they need to know how this is. They need to know that that's a part of life. Death is a part of life. And also to help them to be more preserving of their life and to know what it feels like to hurt from death so that they will be more preserving of their own life. So, that's the best what I can do for you today. Thank you for listening. <clears throat> Thank you, Eva. So, um, I agree with my sister in the East. Um, we're many miles away, but I know that we share common ceremonies to help our people because we've been groomed that way. We didn't wake up when we became old and say, hey, we're going to help our people deal with death. We've been trained all our life. The thing that I want to say is that even though our bodies decay, we've taken our last breath, our heart stops, our spirit continues to flourish, be free, and live in harmony with the Creator. When the greatest gift that my grandmother told me was a very sensitive woman, and I cried sad movies, or if somebody gets hurt, or, you know, I, I, I'm very sensitive. I ask my grandmother, why do I cry, you know, when people get hurt? I know it's not me. She goes, you know what? Tears are the most powerful prayer you can give the creator. You're hurting for that person. You're helping them. Never be ashamed to cry. And when we grieve, don't hold it in. You'll get sick. Let it go. Let the water spirit cleanse you. In our way, we do river baths and we immerse in the water four times. And every season, you go under and you come out and you let out a holler. You go back in and you come out of the water and you let out a holler. The third time, a little bit louder. And they say that fourth time you go under and you come out and you let out the biggest holler ever. And that water spirit comes and cleanses you and takes away all the negative energies. That's what we do. That's one of our ceremonies here. We tie our people with buckskin for a year so that when that falls off, their mourning is over. We do that cleanse, dry the tear ceremony as well. Grief is real. It impacts our lives immensely and deeply. But we have a choice to deal with it, with the grievances of a child, or honorable women and men. And when we understand that our loved one's spirit is now regained everlasting blissful life, filled with peace and happiness, watching over us and reunited with our ancestors. That's truly something to celebrate. Our task for the loved ones that are left behind is to take the time, feel the pain, but have the courage to let it go. Accept the help that others care and want to give you. And then reciprocate. When we live our life to the fullest, we can then, it's our belief, at the end of our journey, when we meet the creator, we should be able to look at him in straight eyes and say, I did the best. I have no regrets. That's what we want to strive for. Nothing to be ashamed of, nothing to be worried about, nothing to harbor ill feelings against anyone else. Because it's our belief that now, as we join our ancestors, we're there to help our families that are left on earth, to care for them. You know, much like my sister here, those spirits come to visit and guide you as, and move you to what you need to do. And we all get messages. Whether it's a book falls on the floor, or 
you walk around and they say that where you walk and you, um, you find a feather or a penny, that's a message from your ancestors. Pick it up, acknowledge it, let it go. So basically, what I want to say to each and every one of you, we could go on and on about the many things that we do in our families, in our communities to help our families grieve. But I want to say that a life goes on and our job is to live life the best way we can and to, to love unconditionally to respect all living things. We may not accept everything, but if we are the author of our own story and when it comes, we will be accountable for that. Um, and you know, our answers track those truths. They, they track our accountability in life and they help us. No matter how you believe, or what ceremony or what religion or what spirituality you follow, there's always a greater power that helps us to live. Our job is to live it the best way we can. Yep, there's, there's little rocks along our journey, but how we handle it is important. So I think that we've gave you a lot of thought today and we shared really from our hearts and we had that ancestral guidance. We hope that somehow we enlighten, enlighten the better understanding and perhaps an acceptance of how we can bridge those gaps of all of our cultures and worlds in Canada and help each other through this process. So I thank you for your time. And it's been a real privilege to be able to share what a little that I know and yet have to learn. So thank you um, very much. And thank you to, to Eva for sharing this time with me and just to refresh my heart and my spirit because I visited your territory. I loved it over there, except the humidity. <laughs> so thank you all for listening. Thank you both so much for providing your insight and wisdom today. and for sharing so beautifully about death and dying and healing in each of your cultures and communities. And we've received many, many comments as you were both sharing, um, comments of gratitude for sharing with us today. And I actually just wanted to share and echo this one comment that we received, which is what a gift you both are sharing with us today. The importance of ritual, viewing death holistically, treating those who have left in ceremony as equals, the importance of grieving time, Many of us have so much to learn, accepting dying as a natural part of living, so much wisdom shared. And I just think this is a beautiful summary of what we experienced here today. So thank you both again so much. Um, we've had a number of questions come in. So thank you to everyone who's in attendance for submitting all your questions. Um, we have a little bit of time, so I'm gonna try and get to as many as possible, but um, if you have any follow-up questions, you can always email us support at dyingwithdignity.ca. Um, so let's get into it quickly. Elva, you mentioned that children are always involved or made aware um, of the realities of death. Do you have any tips on how best to talk about death with children? Um, <clears throat> I guess like that corn story I was talking about. I know that's the one that was told to me. Um, the other, the other story is like a, even watching um, the weeds, like say like the the grasses and how the grasses will go so far, and then how winter comes or the changes of season for us anyway. We have changes of season and we can see it go to seed, and then it and then it dries up and then it can fall over. So we look at the natural life cycle. And, and we explain this is we're the same. We're, we're, we're like, we're like, we're part of creation as well. We're part of creation and that's what happens to us. Or even some things, well, they know, they know themselves, the little ones, like if they're in a garden and they're healthy and they step on something or something breaks or, you know, a leaf, you know, like a part of a limb, well, they, we can talk about that. And when they see it, we'll say, it's just like that. 
how that happens. That happens to us humans as well, you know? So that's, that's the comparison of what we do, that everything has a season. And we can even talk about like, you know, how long a, a fly lives or how long a turtle lives and how long a dog lives. And we can say that, and humans live this long if we get to that part, but so many things can happen along the way. And so as the kids are getting older, they start to understand more and more about that. And so that's what we use. We use the uh, creation around us to help us with these stories or to help to show the children. Yeah. Thank you. Jo Joanne, did you wanna add anything to that question or we can move on to the next one? Oh, I, I just say uh, in our nation, you know, women, I mean, children are, are viewed as very sacred and it's important. They have a very keen mind. So it's very important to be open and honest with them. And don't just say, you know, that. have you ever heard that song, How Far Is Heaven? I haven't, no. Um, Google it. Okay. it it's about a, a child trying to talk to the mother about death and, and she goes oh a daddy's gone to heaven well this child didn't understand so how far is heaven what's it like yeah. you know I want to be there I want my dad so yeah. when we're not open and honest with our children it leaves them with unsolved answers we look at children as the ability because of their pureness they're able to see spirit so in our territory, um, little children are not allowed to be near the coffin for their own protection. Mm. And if they go out at night, they have to have something over their head because we believe that spirit comes through here down or goes out that way. So we protect them that way. Oh. And, on, and women that are uh, pregnant, they are yeah. put with a blanket over to protect that child, the unborn child. Okay, wow. And, and that's also why we have the leather band on them. We have a leather on them that she talked earlier, then it falls off in a year's time. We have that on them. It's, it's to help them keep them tied here so that they, because of what they see, what they might see. So that's to help them to stay here. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm learning so much. And I, I, again, thank you both for sharing. I'm sure we could talk for hours. Um, about all the different traditions and, and things that go on. Um, another question we got, Joanne, you had mentioned some, um, some people choose embalming, um, but we had a question about whether a natural or green burials are most common. Um, they're not that common. Um, I've witnessed two and mm -hmm. I was part of the ceremony and I did not know that this was going to be the process because we were preparing for it to go but uh we wrapped them in a blanket and and you know what happened is that we didn't prepare the loved ones as to how the body changes and mm -hmm. uh, you know and there and um lately there's this new wave of um i forget the, the proper terminology but it's um uh, hot it's like a cremation but it's in hot water okay I, I forget the name of it and I just dealt with it the other day but that's another thing um and you know in our territory we have to uh very seldom do we cremate our people okay thank you uh Elva do you have any experience with with green burials or no no um, no I haven't had any any experiences with that here at six, at six, like Six Nations? Yeah. Um, and, and two, we don't, you know, because what they say is we're, the creator picked us up from the earth uh -huh. and our body needs to go back to the earth, you know? And so, I don't know about the green, I just see what I see on TV about the green burial where they yeah. beg and then plant a tree or whatever. And, and um, but I don't know, that's never happened here. And I don't know, I haven't heard what the mm. tradition, like the elders are saying about, about that, what should we do about that? But I know mm. they do frown on the, um, the cremation, you know, and, but it, when it happens, like there's, that's a person's own personal choice, you know, and then 
you know, they're asked if they're, if they can bury them there, you know, like in our cemetery, mm -hmm. but you know, like it, that's where like they're, they don't have anything like, they just sit with their family plot. They put right. them there with their family plot, but they, like, we don't have a separate section for cremated mm -hmm. people or anything like that. They just go with their own family plot. Right. So that's the only thing I, I know about them, the burial okay. parts. Yeah. And and you both said that uh, cremation is not you don't typically do that, and that's because the body's not returning back into the earth into into nature. Is that yeah. the reasoning for that? Then yeah, okay, interesting. Yeah, um, Elva, you had also mentioned at one point, and someone asked um, that you keep the body for three days. And is this typically done at home, like with wakes and funerals? Are these always done in the person's home or a relative's home? What's the typical? Well, you, us usually they'll do it. They, it, they'll do it at home. They'll do it in the home. But like, say, like if they live in Toronto or something like that, they come. They'll come back. They bring mm -hmm. the body back to maybe a relative's home, and we have them oh. in the home. Um, sometimes, like. Um, sometimes they end up at the um, funeral home, but then because it's at the funeral home, they usually don't have the wakes, but not there because, you know, like, because it's like, it's, it's not, it's not their home, you know, mm -hmm. to like, because they usually have, will have food and eat, like they'll eat and, yeah. and, and you like even have the smudge and things like that. And so a lot of the funeral homes, you know, they don't want they don't um they don't allow it or you know they have a, don't accommodate that i guess right so uh, if they want to have it at uh, their home they have it at home or else a relative's home or even a friend home a friend whoever lets them come in and and do that but mo most of the time um we have we bring them home with, home with us and then um but it's kind of uh, rare that they go to the funeral home you know and um but nowadays it's getting more where our people are are being born and raised off of the territory. So now they they're starting to get where they're they'll get cremated and then they go like just to the just to the funeral home and get cremated and get buried, you know, at a at a cemetery, or whatever, you know, things like that are happening more and more now, but not on the territory so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Joanne, is that the same experience that you've seen? Um, a, a lot of people um, always bring him to their home. And if it's, let's say, if it is a chief and, you know, he was well known within our nation, um, they would definitely have a time just for family in their home. And then maybe on the third day, because we bury our people on the fourth day, they will move them to the community center okay. where, you know, um, especially so that people can support and be there. But it's typically very seldom are we utilizing funeral homes, you know, because a lot of us in our territory are, are not, we are in Kamloops uh, joined to the city, but a lot of them are not. Mm -hmm. Right, okay, yeah, thank you. Um, and let me just see here, I guess just as a final question to you both, and maybe Joanne, you can start us off. Um, do you have any resources that you recommend um, for folks experiencing grief? I don't know if you have any, know of any support groups or book literature, anything that you can, that you yourself have used or shared or that you'd like to share with um, everyone watching today? Call Elva Jameson 911. <laughs> You're the go-to. And I was going to say I haven't written it yet. <laughs> it's um, in here. Yeah, yeah. See, that's the thing. A lot of like even Alva myself, uh, we've been taught these things right from the time we're little. So one of the things that I often uh, help people with, because. Um, I work with the End of Indigenous Life's Journey through First Nations Health Authority. I'm a co-teacher there, so we deal a lot with that. I also am the resident elder from Camp Carry, which is a nonprofit organization that helps specifically with loss and grieving and tools of mental health, music, 
other activities that people can participate in. Um, we have in our nations um, and British Columbia have mental health workers. We have um, knowledge keepers in each um, nation um, that can help. So it's, um, but formally, are there books that I've read about grieving? No, I, I read a lot of things about life and positive things, but uh, there, I think, um, no, I can't say that I could recommend a book <laughs> okay. right now. Uh, that's okay, yeah. Um, and those things that you, you mentioned, um, we'll be sure to share some of those um, with our supporters so that they can look at, at those, um, those resources. Elva, do you have any support groups or yeah, maybe we, you also don't do. have books? <laughs> yeah, no, we don't have books, but um, we have, um, I, I um, help with a bereavement group I don't know how many years it's been now because they asked me if I will if I will share um, share like helping people and so it's like we just we just we it's a, it's ten weeks and sometimes if it's a big group it's twelve weeks and we go and talk about all our stories and we show them the medicines they get to use the medicines everything like that but I don't have no books I don't have books it's all like like right hands-on learning type of thing yes. right? and yes. um, we exactly. help them we we put them through that we put them through that um through that uh wiping the tear ceremony mm -hmm. at the end of it we do that for them we do other things that um a craft of some kind to help them to because it's good to have the memories you know mm -hmm. of our loved ones it's it's like encourage them like it's okay mm -hmm. for for us to honor our dead you know like mm -hmm. don't try to put them away like they're you know because right. they honor them you know so so that's all included in that so yeah. and i and i always said i'll never going to work with the, the death and dying when i was younger but um i didn't realize that lots of our people too they don't they don't know our ways you know mm -hmm. so then they said we need you to come and tell us yeah. so that's how i ended up doing it now i've been doing it i i don't know it's over 80 years i think so but we do that we do it twice we do one in the spring and one in the fall but with COVID it stopped but I'm thinking to do it on a zoom because yeah. see when we're right there then we're able to um, provide the spray we're able to do help them clean them off and we're able mm -hmm. to be there with them to support them you know like when when we when we're when we're really before COVID but now yeah. it's kind of difficult when somebody's breaking down the where's the physical there to help support them so it would be more like learning like how this is like a lot of it is a uh, mental learning right yeah so that's like how it would be something along that line um and then part of a lot of some of what we do is being able to help help them you know to unburden some of what they're carrying so we're there physical to do it so yeah but that's what that's what we do and a lot of people like um when it's when somebody passes they'll get a hold of me and then if there's something i can do to help like i said you know even as far as making their dress or whatever you know right. going to yeah. wash them and going to uh, dress them like she was saying that we, we go dress them so even things like that or you know um helping with some of the cooking or whatever so that's more like along the lines what I do. So I don't really have no books like resources like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. That I yeah. that I share with you. Yeah. You know. So it's just what I could just what I say. That's how our people do it. But then right. how many people? Right. Yeah. Everybody well, got their own rituals, right? Every every culture has their own ways of doing things. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean this. Just this today, this this is a great resource for people. So I mean, everyone who joined, I'm sure, is get, having a lot to take away from um, both your stories and and our discussion. And I want to thank you both again for for coming today and and spending some time with us and sharing. Um, our next session will take place on Wednesday, May 26th at 3 p.m. Eastern time, and the topic will be how to be there for someone who is grieving. So please use the uh, link in the chat to register. It's 
been posted there now. And uh, once again, thank you both, Joanne and Elva. It was great to, to have you both here. And I hope you um, enjoy the rest of uh, your day and everyone stay safe and, and be well. So thank you. Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.